We're going to have Think Tech Hawaii, um, uh, Think Tech Tech Talks. And today we're going to talk about um, the data divide and uh, what we can do about it. And we have uh, Jillian Dybal. She's in Washington. She's a policy analyst. And we like both of those things. We like policy and we like analysis. And she's at the Center for Data Innovation. And she moderated a uh, webinar in Washington a few days ago about the importance of the data divide and uh, what we can do about it, what we should do about it, what policymakers should do about it. So we are so delighted to have you on the show, Jillian. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So what is the, uh, what is the Center for Data Innovation? Uh, tell us about the organization, what it does, and how far it reaches. Yeah, so um, like I said, we're based in Washington, D.C. Um, Center for Data Innovation is part of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, ITIF. It's a mouthful. Um, and we're a nonpartisan nonprofit think tank, and we study the intersection of data technology and public policy. Um, and so part of our work involves educating policymakers and the public, like I'm doing now, about the opportunities and challenges associated with data, um, as well as technology trends relating to artificial intelligence and open data and the Internet of Things. Um, and so I'm pretty early in my career, and I joined the Center for Data Innovation a little over a year ago, and I lead my team's work on digital inequalities. Um, and I've also done some work on web scraping and AI and open data issues, and I'm especially interested in data for social good. So all of those good issues is kind of what we cover here at the center. I got it all except for the web scraping. What's that? What's web scraping? You know, it's when um, if you're a researcher and you need to get um, data from a publicly available website, so you want um, you want to create, you know, uh, a data, a giant data set of like all tweets on a subject. And, you know, that could be hundreds of thousands of data points. It's sort of an automated program that lets you collect all that data at once. Like a crawler. A little bit. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> controversial, but not controversial. I think it's journalists, researchers love it. Companies don't love it. It's complicated. Yeah. Okay. It's, well, why, you know, it's why it's a good one to look at. You know. <laughs> one of one of the challenges that you know that you see that you deal with. Uh, I mean, imagine, um, you know, of all the things that happen in the world of data, there are plenty of them, and you have you know before you determine policy and um, you know advocate for one policy or another, you have to identify the problems. So I know we we only have half an hour here. We could spend a lot of time on this, but can you give us a some of the primary problems in in data in data divide here in the United States, well, in the world today. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's easiest to start kind of with just the definition, right? So the data divide is a, a term coined by the center actually before I started there about 10 years ago, um, but it's been kind of where we're bringing this issue back to, to light, but it's the social and economic inequalities that result from a lack of collection of data and use of data um, by certain individuals and communities. So even though right now um, advances in technology have made it cheaper and easier than, than ever to collect and use data, some groups still lack really high quality data that they can put to um, productive use about themselves. And that kind of hinders everything from um, you know, it hinders data-driven innovation, and it really impacts everything from their health outcomes to public safety to um, economic growth. Wow. So it's very important to understand the world around us. I guess that's what I get out of it. And you, you these days in the complexity of the 21st century, we cannot understand the world around us without, without having the data. Um, exactly. what, what distinguishes somebody who's on the right side of the divide? And I don't mean that politically. Maybe I do. <laughs> Uh, who's on the right <laughs> side of the divide and who's on the wrong side of the divide. How can you tell the difference between somebody who is who has it and doesn't? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the key question. And it's really whether it comes down to whether data-driven services um, work for you and you kind of feel confident that they are working for you and or whether they don't. Um, so probably the best way to do that is to just go right into an example. Um, so with financial services, you know, I would say you and I, have, I'm, maybe I'm assuming we have credit cards um, and the credit agencies, um, but not everyone does. And that's sort of, that's a divide in itself, right? Um, whether you have access to credit or not, and that comes down to data. So the credit agencies, they have, they're built on certain systems that, you know, underwrite loans and whatever. Um, and they, they need certain data that allows them to collect and score individuals. 
Um, and that's usually based on so-called traditional items about, you know, financial borrowing and your, your repayment, loan repayment history. Um, but those same systems are not equipped to take in um, so-called alternative data sources. So they leave out things about your on-time rental payments. So they really privilege home ownership um, or they leave out your utility payments, your cell phone bills, um, your cash flow in your bank account. And so as a result, um, you know, a lot of consumers are kind of um, left unbanked or, you know, left with unnecessarily low or, or really inaccurate, inaccurate scores. So, you know, that's an obvious one, you know, whether or not you have access to a credit score that you believe actually represents your um, credit worthiness or, or whatever you want to say. Um, and I think these kinds of examples really pop up in, in so many different facets of life. Mm. So um, I asked you this before, you told me you were writing a paper about it. What's the difference between the, the digital divide and the data divide? Let me make a guess before you start. Uh, you know, Please. here in Hawaii, we have areas that are poor and rural, and nobody in the given neighborhood has a computer even. Um, they don't have broadband. In fact, we have a, a state broadband strategy officer whose job it is to try to get broadband to areas that are disadvantaged. Is that mm -hmm. the digital divide or am I missing the boat? No, that's the, that's the digital divide. And I think like where policy, at, and at least in Washington, is now is that the digital divide really just pertains to, to, to internet, to, to broadband. Um, so it's all worried about broadband deployment and adoption. Um, and so we kind of, I mean, the, the term obviously builds off that. It's using the same, the same alliteration, whatever, data divide, digital divide. And the data divide, like I said, is really just instead of do you have access and can you put broadband to use, do you have data? And so it's sort of taking a step back and just looking at the fundamental you know, building blocks of information and say, what information do you have about yourself? It's not necessarily about, can you get connected to the internet? You know, where the focus has been on that for the last decade and it's reaching pretty high levels of adoption. Um, obviously in the, the poor rural areas you're speaking about, there's still work to be done. But, you know, I think now the thing to worry about is, you know, we're in the internet economy, that's, that's agreed upon. And we're kind of moving into this data economy, so to speak, where data is sort of the new, you know, currency in some ways, although I don't love that analogy. Um, but, you know, data empowers you to do a lot of things and to participate in the economy. And so when there's that that the, that divide um, of you don't have the data about yourself, you're kind of going to be left behind in that. And so that's kind of why we built off that digital divide terminology um, in this report. And so the next one is going to be exploring, you know, what solutions do we have for the digital divide and what what's out there right now? What kind of programs are we, are we doing? Um, what's the government doing? And sort of I'm going to be saying, you know, what should we be doing? And do those solutions work for the data divide? The answer, spoiler alert, is sort of no. Um, and sort of what do the solutions look like? What does policy solutions look like for the data divide? Um, we can't just say, oh, because they sound the same, digital divide solutions work for data divide. They kind of require a little bit different, different, different thought pattern. So let's assume for a minute that I don't have a, a digital divide problem, that I, that I can get the broadband, I can put a browser up, um, and I can, you know, I, you know, my own experience is I can learn anything I want, really, anything uh, with a browser and broadband, anything. Well, that's because of Google. I hate <laughs> to mention a commercial name, but that is exactly because of Google. So why can't I, as a person um, on the wrong side of the data divide, get on the right side of the data divide, just learning, just Googling everything, just finding YouTube is another commercial name. YouTube videos uh, or Vimeo videos or some kind of information on my system and educating myself. What is stopping me from doing that? And if I do that, won't I be able to cross? May I say this? I, I've been waiting to say this to you. May I cross the divide? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good question, but I think what it is is that, you know, yeah, you can Google anything, but can you Google actual information about yourself? Can you Google things about what's your possible, your personal um, health outcome if X, Y, and Z, or, you know, where should you go to school based on your specific educational history? I think those are the kinds of things that it's a lot harder to bridge. Um, like, you know, the, the, the internet doesn't really just let us bridge that. You can't just Google personal information about yourself and see patterns over time. And so that's really what the data divide is and why it's a little more than just having access to information, although obviously I want that for everyone and everyone should have that. Um, it's more about, you know, information about yourself here is the real, the real problem. And what mm -hmm. that's what that's what these communities and, and people, I mean, you and I probably there's divides here 
um, that's what people are lacking is, is sort of information about themselves as it pertains to health, education, financial services, the environment, um, you know, if you're a certain gender or race or whatever, um, all those things, it's, you can't find that information. If you don't have enough data collected about you, you won't be able to see that kind of thing about yourself. Are you including communities? Uh, it sounds like you are. In other words, uh, I'm, I'm a redhead. I'm not a redhead. I was never a redhead, but <laughs> I'm a redhead and I want to connect up with other redheads. Uh, are you wrapping around the whole notion of social media and uh, finding people of like mind, like interest, like persuasion? Is that part of being on the right side of the data divide? Yeah, I think it's especially about information about that community. So yeah, we'll use the redhead example. You know, it's you can be connected to them by internet, but again, do you have information about people with that specific trait and your outcome in X, Y, and Z? So it's so yeah, I mean, it really is. We look at it. At the, I think it's it's most important sort of at the community level because that's you know where a lot of trends happen and that's kind of where that's how data collection is done, especially when you want to preserve privacy. You know, you have to look at it at the at the group level. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that thinking is is sort of right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you know the the problem I see is that you know you, suppose you cross over and you learn about programs that can help you, and those programs uh, help you take better care of yourself. Those programs help you learn about mm, the possibilities that uh, you can uh, employ to become more successful, more more wealthy in the community. Um, do more have more, learn more, all that. Um, but, but, here's the big but. This is a moving target. Just as you and I speak, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of programmers out there and entrepreneurs and companies that are inventing new software to give new leverage, new justice to, to bring that term into play. Um, and so how can I possibly keep track of that? How can you keep track of that? How can we collectively achieve that kind of justice uh, when it's moving all the time. I think, I think it's a great point. I think it's just that we really need to raise the baseline. And that kind of is where I would bring in the, the data equity term of that. You know, it's not necessarily, I, at least to me, I don't think the goal should be every single person has a smartwatch. Um, it's more that every single person has an X standard of data collection about them. And so that, you know, obviously that's something that policymakers really need to prioritize. And, you know, we need to be able to trust them to do so effectively um, about, you know, what are the key areas where those those data gaps really persist? Because like you said, yeah, new things are coming up every day. And it's not necessarily important that every single person can keep up with every individual fitness tracker, but it is really important that, you know, every hospital system is held to the same standard of, you know, data access or, or data sharing so that when you move to one or the other, you can choose where your data goes and, you know, whether whether your doctor has access to it, that kind of thing. So yeah. I think it's a tricky question, obviously, but I think it's the system level is sort of we need to worry about the systems rather than maybe the individual devices here. You know, I think we need to think about healthcare as an umbrella system or education as the system. And so raising the baselines of those will kind of allow us to allow it to be dynamic and sort of just keep keep moving in the right direction rather than kind of getting bogged down on, oh no, they missed this one, this one device or or whatever. So okay, um justice, just to dwell on that for a moment. Um, what, what's, how do you fit justice into all of this? What is justice in the context of the data divide? Um, um, what, what do you seek? What do I want? What is a better community and, and how do we achieve justice? Is, is, it, is it a legal thing, a philosophical thing, a technological thing? What is it? Um, I mean, I think it's a good question. Again, I think it's, it's a technological thing and it's again, ensuring an and you as an individual, you know, believing that these data collection systems are to your benefit. So it sort of brings in the trust issue to me um, is really, you know, trusting that these data driven technologies, they work for you. And, you know, I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, concern or hostility around some of them because, you know, people are seeing there's, you know, when there's um, incomplete inputs, you know, it's, it's coming out with, with inaccurate outputs. And that applies to so many different systems right now but i think that it's it, that creates you know the trust problem of i don't believe that that system is actually working to my benefit it's actually harming me and you know that might be happening right now so i think where justice comes in or the, it's really the equity concern comes in is that we're raising the baseline for everyone so everyone can kind of feel a lot better about 
you know, um, how these services are working and how this kind of decision making is working to someone's um, advantage or, or, you know, to believe that it is doing so called a fair decision making. Well, you've opened a really, really interesting connection between you know, our life in these times and the whole notion of uh, um, data equity. And um, I, I just, you know, the word trust sticks in my brain, trust. We have such trouble these days in trusting information, trusting facts, um, trusting mm, conspiracy theories, if you like, and trusting, you know, trusting lies. Uh, and I mean, that's just all over the media. It's all over our social cultural world right now. And doesn't that infect the problem for you, for those who would follow and analyze the, the data divide? You know, it doesn't mean anything if you don't trust it. And we have a trust crisis. What What is your thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like the key pro policy problem to solve, right? Um, and it applies in so many ways, but I think in in tech policy specifically, it kind of relates to this this host the tech lash or whatever you want to call it, the hostility towards big tech and all of that, and really just technology as a whole. It doesn't necessarily have to be big. Tech. But that's part of the um, anti science sentiment in the country. Isn't you know, it? in a sense, at least at least part of it is, yeah. And so I think um, the way trust comes in here, how you solve it again is sort of it's only until we really improve these systems and by improve these systems, I mean, improve their key inputs. So I trust that what is going into a system that's making a decision about whether I get credit or not, I trust that that information is accurate, complete, um, and actually represents who I am or what I, what I do and whatnot. Um, and I think that is kind of what's missing here. That's the data divide really in its essence. So it's sort of you know, but closing it, that's the solution really is reducing it because reducing it will sort of naturally, in, at least I theorize, it'll naturally kind of improve um, trust overall and at least sort of ameliorate some of the hostilities. It's not going to solve, you know, the greater partisan trust problem that we have in the United States. That's not at all what I'm saying, but I do think it'll sort of reduce some of the hostilities towards technology as a whole. And I think that's really important. Yes, it is. I mean, to move forward, we have to trust it. We have to trust this huge system on which we live. Um, so uh, I want to talk uh, for a little bit about your um, webinar in Washington a few days ago, where you moderated. No, no easy task on a subject <laughs> so complex. Can you give us a thumbnail of, of what it was like, of who was there, the subjects covered? You don't have to yeah. get very specific. I, I, I don't want you to bore us. No boring. We don't do boring. But <laughs> <laughs> could you tell us uh, how that went? It was great. Um, I think the highlight was really that we had um, U.S. Chief Data Scientist Denise Ross um, give a keynote speech. And so I think that, again, was obviously the highlight of it. Um, Denise is working, works with the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. Um, and her, her remarks kind of just surrounded all these good issues about the data divide and, and really went into the concept of kind of equitable data engagement and collection and all of that, which is, it's it sort of when in the report I'm recommending, you know, policymakers need to prioritize this through concrete federal action. I think um, the work of OSTP, Office of, Office of Science and Technology Policy, is, is really doing just that. And that's kind of what she was speaking about. She was speaking about all these opportunities for the public to actually participate and say, I'm missing or I am from X background and there's not data in X agency about me. Um, they've opened up a request for information on that kind of subject, um, which I think is really exciting. And that's kind of what she went into was, you know, um, again, sort of just shedding um, the way more data will kind of shed light on issues that we didn't even know about. You know, it's not necessarily or it's not due to it's not on purpose that some federal agencies are missing information about some groups. Um, it's just it's sort of a fact and, the, and what happens with data collection, especially at such a massive scale as the federal statistical system is that they don't even know where the gaps are. So I think she was talking about how it's uh, the, all the opportunities kind of to, to contribute and say I'm directly affected or my community is directly affected or my school district is that kind of thing. And I think it was it was a really great speech that kind of, again, touched on all the, the issues that I wanted to hear about. And then in the panel. Um, Can we see four, can we see it? Is your webinar available for us? It is. It's available on, on our website, datainnovation.org, under events or um, on YouTube under the same channel name. Um, Did she and talk about data analysis? Um, what, what I mean is 
you know, you can have all the data in the world, but at the end of the day, you can make so much more of it if you have tools to analyze it. And that, of yeah. course, includes AI, doesn't it? Did she talk about that? Um, so she definitely talked about the need, I mean, high quality. So raising the standard across the, she was specifically talking about federal data, raising the standard there across the board. And then she talked about, and I think it's it's a really key theme that I'm thinking about, and OSTP is definitely thinking about, about disaggregation. So, you know, you have this giant pool of data, but can you split it up specifically by race, gender, age, income, eh, whatever, whatever other kind of like split you want? Um, and can you cross, can you cross this, you know, can you look at it in, in two ways? You know, can you see just um, white women or whatever? Um, so she, she, yeah, she spoke about that and she spoke about that specific part again as a focus right now. Um, it sort of seems obvious, I think, maybe, maybe not, but it seems obvious, you know, our census data would be disaggregated by all this. And it is largely, but, you know, when you get into some more specific agencies um, that might relate to public health or something like that, it's often not split. And, or maybe it's just split by two races instead of, you know, however many there should be. Um, so I think there's some, it's sort of sometimes egregious examples, actually. And that's that's another big focus of the current administration. And so she definitely touched on the disaggregation aspect of analysis. Mm. Okay, who else was there uh, in terms of the speakers, the panel? And who did you have to uh, uh, moderate? Um, yeah, we had Chris Wood. He's the executive director of LGBT Tech. So they kind of focus on um, all the good tech policy issues like data equity and, and things like that, but from the specifically LGBT angle. Um, we had Dominique Harrison, who heads, um, I'm going to forget her full title, but she's at City Ventures Innovation, and she's kind of heading their diversity, equity, and inclusion as it pertains to data research. Um, we had a um, program manager from Microsoft who works on their accessibility team, Ioana Tanase. And then lastly, I had Dr. Tracy Morris, who is from the um, uh, is the director of the American Indian Policy Institute? So she works on things as um, tech policy issues, especially broadband as it relates to Native Americans and Native American access and inclusion. Um, so was, I mean, they they all brought I think really interesting perspectives and kind of uh, different. I think they agreed on more than maybe I thought they all would, which which is a good thing. You know, I mean, everyone is sort of we're seeing this issue, and I think what's interesting is that. On the data divide issue, there's actually a lot of consensus um, surrounding the issue, but no one's necessarily talking about it in the exact same terminology. So kind of the term data divide itself provides like one way to unite all these groups who are worried about all these issues, especially from the diversity, equity, and inclusion angle, um, to sort of just all put all the efforts into one, you know, one streamline, which is, which is great. Well, that's valuable, you know, just to get the nomenclature um, down together and have agreement on the nomenclature is a valuable result. Um, right. What else? Who else? Uh, what else did you do? Uh, did you have breakout sessions? Did you have group discussions? Did you have surveys and polls and Q and A? This is an event. You're asking for a lot from a from an hour long webinar. Um, you know, no, we had so we had this the keynote speech and then the panelists had about 45 minutes of discussion and audience questions. And I think the audience questions were really interesting because they actually wanted to take. Um, the issue, which uh, my panelists were all from the U.S. and talking about the U.S. context, but the audience was super interested in, you know, how do we um, think about this issue on the global scale, especially when the issues are global, like climate change or things like that. So I think we got into that a little bit at the end. And as a shameless plug, I think I will having an event kind of taking it to the to the international <laughs> level um, in a few months. Oh, good. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm yeah, glad to hear that. So that's a good direction. <laughs> Yeah, Go looking at how the you know international institutions are kind of dealing with it or thinking about the issue or not. So that's exciting. Well, um, you talked earlier about uh, you know finding you know the issues around the divide, uh, and then discussing policy. And indeed, you are a policy analyst <laughs> yourself. That is um, Jillian Dibo, a policy <laughs> analyst. So what came out of this webinar in terms of policy? And when I say policy, I mean not just conceptually um, what should be done, but uh, exactly what should be done where. Yeah, um, I think it is what Denise in her speech talked about. There are at least two, if not more, open requests for comments right now, which means policy analysts like me are going to be, I, mean, I am currently writing comments, um, but also members of the public should be writing it and saying this is how this specific 
um, lack of data is really affecting me. So I think that's where policy is at right now. And obviously, you know, it's sort of slow moving, but in certain um, niches of the bit, I mean, obviously this is a massive umbrella issue. I think we're seeing some progress. So especially within LGBT data and inclusion, there's been some legislative action um, kind of on in enshrining um, data collection about that community. Um, likewise with Native American data, actually. And I think I, there's so kind of, a, it's currently kind of on a piece, piece by piece basis of, you know, X demographic. Um, or location. I think there has been some movement around rural data as well. But right now, again, it's it's sort of about the Biden administration wants as much information as they can get. So it's on it's kind of on the public. It's on the it's on the policy world. It's on everyone to sort of contribute that information. That's that's where we're at. How do you distinguish between data? You know, that is, um, you know, for example, there was a piece in the paper this morning about Ed Snowden. And uh, Vladimir Putin has made him a citizen of Russia. Uh, mm -hmm. that there's, there's, um, that, that's troubling in some ways because he had a lot of data in his mind. He, he took away uh, all kinds of classified data. And of course, we've seen issues around classified data in Mar-a-Lago and all that, which is you know, a big deal. Um, but how do you distinguish between data that should be public, that should be available to people, and data that should not? I think that's the key question. And I know we're kind of running, running out of time, but the key question here is data already has strong um, de-identification protocols that's collected by the federal government. So I think that in my opinion, most data should be open. And that that's, that's the view of the federal government as well, is that the more information available for researchers, for, for you and I, the better. That's my general philosophy. And obviously, I think it's a controversial one, but we can kind of we can debate that all day. <laughs> well, let me go a step further. Um, let's say let's say that, that that philosophy is the enlightened philosophy. And I certainly agree with you. Um, what how is society, the human experience, the world, and I'm referring to your next webinar, <laughs> uh, how, how does that improve the world? How does it improve the quality of life, the, the quality of, of, of governing and self-governing, um, the quality of the economy and, and, you know, and all those things that come with a, a more enlightened life? What are you seeking in terms of connecting the data, you know, being on the right side of the data divide and a better world? What is that world like because of the data? I think it's a more equitable world. So, you know, these systems are including many more people and, you know, maybe the, 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 the communities that kind of stand to benefit the most. So it's, it's sort of trusting that the medicine you're receiving is the correct medicine for you. And not only is it the correct medicine for you, but it will work the best for you. Or, you know, it, it will really, you know, more data will really enhance um, our ability to sort of come up with new mitigation or adaptation strategies for climate change. It's its all things like that. I think it'll, it, with more data, it will both empower individuals, so that we'll have this more participatory relationship with, with government or with whatever institution, because you are empowered to say, I know that this is happening to me and I have concrete evidence in the form of data. I think that's another thing that you would see. Um, so, you know, the, this sort of data-driven world, it's really important that it is kind of including as many people as possible. And I think that it will include, with more data collection, we will be able to include more people and sort of, again, it kind of to tie it loosely to that trust issue, it's more people will also feel, feel better about the data that's being collected about them and the fact that it is being collected about them because they'll sort of see the benefits to it mm -hmm. um, firsthand. So, um, yeah, you talk about the number of people and I'm wondering, What's your, what's your, what's your reach, Jillian? I mean, uh, how many members or followers, what have you, um, are following um, the Center for Data Innovation? How many people showed up at the webinar, uh, and what do you see in terms of um, you know increasing that reach going forward, especially with your notion of expanding you know your research, analysis, and policy beyond the United States and into a global sphere? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a a great question. I think the webinar, well. I'll preface it by saying the policy world, everyone, um, you asked me this off camera, but you know, everyone's kind of a nerd about their specific issues. So I think that's that's important to preface. But you know, the webinar had about 300 attendees, which is actually 
um, we were really happy with that fact. And mm -hmm. I think it kind of is because it includes this issue. The data divide includes um, so many different umbrellas. So you might just do climate policy. Oh, the data divide applies to you. You might just do um, data analysis as a raw discipline that applies to you. Oh, you only want to work on healthcare. This applies to you. So we were able to kind of bring in so many different policy viewpoints. And, and these, these are the webinars we host at the Center for Data Innovation. They're open to the public, I would say, but they're largely targeted at, at the policy community. So we're all kind of getting on the same page and learning from each other about these topics. So yeah, we had around 300 people. And I think when it comes to the center itself, um, you know, we have a newsletter and a social media accounts that reaches um, many, many more. I, I wish I knew the exact amount <laughs> off my head, but I don't, um, you know, thousands of people, honestly. And so I think there is, and again, there's so much potential with this issue to really raise the, raise um, awareness about it, um, just because it encompasses so many different facets of policy, daily life, whatever you want to say. And you're a 501c3 yes. um, a nonprofit uh, exempt organization, uh, supported, mm -hmm. I suppose, by a, a wide swath of members all around uh, yeah, who, help you, who help you uh, operate. That's great. So yeah. uh, one more time, your website. It is datainnovation.org, and you can find the report on there under report. <laughs> Thank you, Jillian. Jillian Diebold, uh, uh, the moderator of this uh, webinar. It sounds terrific. I'm sorry I wasn't there, but I'll try to be at the next one, and I'll try to circle back with you so we can have a similar discussion about the next one. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jillian, and great talking to you. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.